let the church be one strong body walking together. Let the church be one strong body walking together. Every member touched by each other keeping together. Every member touched by each other keeping together. Every member touched by each other keeping together. Every member touched by each other. This next song we're going to be singing in our closing service um, at Canterbury Cathedral on Sunday. So do, do plug in and learn this song with us this morning. Focus and my devotion. 
Let's thank. Khalina, Khalina, Ashkuru, Firga Tamurani Minde, Tani. Shukran Leta Home, Ushukran Umbari Jazz Command, Kanta Mam, Tani Tokum, Yani Mohubin, Shadi, the Sabahir Kulakum, Inshallah Tokum. Today we have the last Bible exposition of the conference and the theme will be authority in Christ. The Bible verses we're going to be looking at today are 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 1 to 14. We look forward to welcoming Archbishop Justin to give us his final Bible exposition but we, before we do that Miranda from the St. Anselm community is going to come and read the Bible passage for us. Thanks Miranda. Now, as an elder myself, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory to be revealed, I exhort the elders among you to tend the flock of God that is in your charge, exercising the oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you do it, not for sordid gain, but eagerly, do not lord it over those in your charge, but be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will win the crown of glory that never fades away. In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. And all of you must clothe yourselves with humility in your dealings with one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters throughout the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Through Sylvanus, whom I consider a faithful brother, I have written this short letter to encourage you and to testify that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. Your sister church in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. The roaring lion. I cannot get used to injustice. Uh, I faced a lot of injustice in my land, in my country, personally, in my family, and uh, seeing uh, many others um, suffering from injustice. Crossing a checkpoint is humiliating, uh, and that's injustice. Uh, I faced it, I lived all my life under occupation, but I cannot get used to uh, an injustice. Uh, that's a cry, that's a call to, to do something about it. Uh, not to take revenge, no, but to uh, practice the commandment of love towards everyone, especially those who suffer from injustice. I see the roaring lion in my context um, in, the suffer, in the suffering caused by war and displacement. And this has created um, brokenness, anxiety, uh, trauma, and sometimes loneliness and isolation. In Ghana, 
in my own local countries, road accidents are on the increase. Armed robbery, the astronomic fuel prices. I think the roaring lion that has the capacity to seek to devour where I am, the church and what it stands for, is a kind of aggressive, unthought out secularism. And I am always willing to engage a robust intellectual argument. But we certainly experience here a kind of um, aggressive, ill thought out secularism, which wants to diminish and even silence the church's intelligent attempts to make a contribution to the public square. And to me, the Roaring Lion is an attitude which is very prevalent around me, which suggests that the Christian voice in society is not just unintelligent, but actually dangerous. The Roaring Lion in my context is corruption and land of na uh, national resources. Ultimately, this perpetuates po poverty and makes the poor poorer and the richer uh, richer. A roaring lion uh, for asylum seekers in, in Cyprus is, is loss of hope. In my context, a roaring lion is occupation. Occupation, uh, 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 unfortunately, uh, drives people uh, from their homes uh, and, and, and pushes people uh, from their from their land, from their olive trees, uh, from their history, from their culture. For me, Roaring Lion is fear. We're living at, in the moment at a time when leaders appear to be Roaring Lions, um, from what I see. And in my context, I think of the Roaring Lion as somebody who abuses their position of leadership and power for selfish ambition. In my context, Leon Rugiente is la indiferencia. In my context, uh, a Roaring Lion is the devil himself who comes to destroy and steal and kill. So when he sees that people are in unity, he comes in and scatter people and make people leave the place and not live in harmony and in oneness. In my context, the ruling government is actively playing on the side of roaring lion by allowing persecutions withdrawing benefits over conversion, etc. A roaring lion, I would say, for us, colonialism, uh, new colonialism, uh, checked, unchecked capitalism, or forms of uh, domination, subjugation, would be a, uh, a roaring lion uh, that threatens not only our lives, but uh, our humanity. The roaring lion in my context, it expels danger from someone in power who can do whatever they like, even to the extent of manipulating and using others for their own gain. So I'll put it in one word. The, the roaring lion, as I see today, is corruption. The quest for what does not belong to you, be it power, be it property, be it purse, whatever, now that's the roaring lion that is gnawing the very fabric of society today. Now corruption devours creation. The roaring lion for me in Canada is an individualistic culture that focuses on hustling and always doing more. Um, it's focused on achieving and what benefits me as an individual and putting relationships on the back burner um, or neglecting them completely. You know, recently we had a, a target killing of one of our lay pastors because uh, the ISIS that used to be in Iraq and uh, Syria, they have shifted to Afghanistan. So the uh, wave of terrorism has entered into Pakistan. It is a roaring line for us, which really shakes the uh, uh, people whom we look after and uh, we work with. So this is a roaring line for us.
Let us pray. Our enemy, the devil, may be prowling around, but he is utterly and completely, overwhelmingly, decisively, permanently defeated by you, O Lord, in your birth, your life, your passion, your crucifixion, your resurrection, your ascension, and in the sending of the Holy Spirit. So as we look at this chapter, give us hearts that are brave and joyful, knowing that we celebrate the victory of the Lamb and of the people of God. Amen. <clears throat> there are, as we heard just now, significant and terrifying lions in our world. And this lion is the devil, powerful evil. And so often when we read 1 Peter, we don't really get to the lions because, well, we, the global north, in the global north, um, not, you know, the devil, I mean, you know, picture of something with horns and a tail. But it's not what Peter is saying. Peter is talking to people in the depths of trouble. And those extraordinary vox pops, those extraordinary videos seem to me to set out beautifully the multiple ways in which the roaring lion, the enemy, is encountered, particularly the last two, from secularism and an individualism through to ISIS and assassination. This chapter, the culmination of Peter's writing, unpacks for us what the call of a shepherd and of the whole community under their care really entails. If being a good shepherd is about, is about protecting the flock, resisting the lions roaring around, seeking to devour the sheep, is the top point of the job description. In England, when you become a bishop, you get a sort of role description. And I read it out at the confirmation of election. And people easily remember the top one, and I can't remember many of mine, but that's a confession that I'll leave for later. But the top point is protect the flock. And Peter is clear that our proper attitude towards this lion is watchful, clear-headed, confident resistance. The command is to keep alert. There is no option for laziness or complacency. A key core part of being a good shepherd is resisting the adversary, the lion. There is no option for being distracted by other matters. Keep alert. Don't be reading a book, looking at someone else, arguing with another shepherd. Who or what is the adversary? For contemporary Christians in the global church, those forces which stand for all that is evil are numerous and should be named as they have been in those beautiful testimonies. We have considered in previous sessions and in the first keynote, the tendency to tell those who are suffering to keep quiet and to endure. Jesus' radical call through Peter in this final chapter is confront the lions, shepherds, confront the lions, resist the adversary, protect the flock. So what does it mean to be 
a shepherd in 1 Peter, how does that relate to our understanding of being shepherds in God's flock? Let's listen to some testimonies from across the communion. <clears throat> the shepherd is one who speaks with and for the poor, a promoter as well as protector of justice and human dignity. Those that will move from their comfort zones and be where it matters most, among the least, among the common. A shepherd is the one who extends his soul, a, a shoulder for me, that I can cry on it, you know, in time of suffering and in time of disturbance and in time of really atrocities. A shepherd is uh, one who can really embrace me. And the shepherd is one whose presence and whose nearness enables me for a sound sleep, you know. In our context, the shepherd cares for the flock through ringing the bell, summoning the faithful to prayer and worship. He prays for them and for their healing. He feeds himself from the word of God and feeds others. In my context, a shepherd is someone who gives his life in order to protect others. Shepherd is who knows the people, who has concern for the people, loving, caring, and praying for the people. A shepherd should have an exemplary life. In my context, I would say a shepherd is that auntie in church who you know, if, if you're going the wrong way, she is going to say something about it. Although we can't often change the future for them, shepherding is enabling others to recognize that they have the gifts to accompany um, asylum seekers a little on their journey to make the time that they have in Cyprus um, a better one for them. And as a good shepherd, we would want to leave the 99 sheep and go after the one lost sheep. It tells me that everybody matter. Yeah, I can, I can think of a couple of uh, clergy who have, um, you know, particularly during the, the wartime and people, mass, uh, mass groups of people were displaced, um, clergy and lay leaders who could have, um, if they wanted to use their power to uh, uh, escape in a different way, chose to move with their communities throughout the displacement areas. So they went into uh, camps, they went into um, areas that uh, were not very well, very well resourced um, to be in solidarity with their, with their parish, with the people who uh, didn't have the power to escape that conflict. A shepherd uh, is a person who has a prophetic voice in, in the midst of challenge, in the midst of difficult times. In my personal life, I have seen um, a good shepherd um, through uh, my pastor who led me to Christ um, in the days of my youth. And to me, he has been a, a good shepherd who has walked with me all through my faith. And up until this day, he has been following me up and he has been a good shepherd. Sorry. Um, one of my sisters says he was like a walking Jesus and indeed he was like a walking Jesus. He would reach out uh, to me in my lows and in my highs and he would always have that booming smile on him and he was someone that the love of Christ and the light of Christ radiates in him.
A shepherd is like a walking Jesus who radiates the love of Christ. This is not in my text, but I want to say to you that my heart is full of love for those who are here. Bursts with love for you because so many of you are the most wonderful good shepherds. And just from the travels of the last almost 10 years, I look around this room and see the most wonderful shepherds who go into camps, who are refugees, who see their houses pillaged, who are hunted and chased, and are still good shepherds. Thank you. Thank you. First Peter was written before the ministry of the church solidified into the threefold order of bishop, presbyter, and deacon. And unlike other New Testament writings, Peter does not use the word episkopos for bishop, which we translate as bishop, overseer. He uses the, word, the term elder, presbyteros, and in a moment of great beauty, he describes himself as not the primus inter pares presbyteros. He describes himself as the sum presbyteros, the alongside shepherd, a fellow elder, a fellow with you, who shares with you. Peter looks at us, and in his humility says, I am with you. I am like you. It's a neutral term. It can be translated as both female and male elders. It de designates older people within the congregation, possibly people who are older in the faith. Peter calls himself a fellow elder rather than an apostle, teacher, or spiritual father. In choosing the same title as those to whom he is writing, he signals that he has common cause with them. He writes to them as one of them. The verb to shepherd echoes the command to Peter at the end of John's Gospel to shepherd and nurture the flock of Jesus. Feed, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. It calls to mind Jesus' own teaching about the nature of the good shepherd in John 10, verses 1 to 18. The shepherd who lays down his life for the flock, whose sheep know his voice, who know his sheep by name, and who leads his sheep out to pasture. And the shepherd is the one who searches for the lost sheep. As I've commented before, that image of shepherd goes back a thousand years in the Bible to the 23rd Psalm and is picked up again and again in the scriptures. It is one of the most important metaphors and ways of understanding the shepherd. The shepherd is both pastor and evangelist. He looks after the flock, she, he, reaches out and cares and finds the lost. And in the ancient world, to be a shepherd was a call to demotion rather than promotion. Shepherding calls for relationship, and that is what allows the flock to flourish. You often see shepherds working in partnership with each other. Shepherding is not to be, and Peter sets out three ways, three things to consider. It's not to be done by compulsion, nor for gain, nor with a sense of, oh, I am so important. 
because I'm a shepherd. I am over everyone. Shepherding, says Peter, the flock, is to be undertaken willingly, eagerly, and setting an example. And Peter takes the imitation of Christ one step further through the image of the shepherd, calling the elders to example and in his own mind, I'm sure, remembering not only the command to tend the flock, he is, after all, the one of the epistle writers who picks up the image of the shepherd, not only to tend the flock, but he also remembers that the shepherd, he, the good shepherd, he looks back to, washed his feet. And a few hours later, he betrayed that shepherd and restored him and challenged the injustice of empire and rulers, challenged the sin of the world by laying down his life on the cross, by his coronation on the cross, in, jo in John's terms. And where we are commanded to be examples, it is better put across by the sense of be those who are becoming examples. Because if you're like me, I only have to look back over the last 24 hours and I think I'm a pretty bad example. All of us look in on ourselves and we feel, ooh, I got that one wrong, I messed up that, I failed. Be becoming is so much more encouraging. It tells us we are on a journey of growth into being shepherds. Ultimately, elders remain members of the flock. We are ourselves two things. And by we, I mean all of us in here and all of us online. We are shepherds, and we are shepherded by the chief shepherd, by Jesus himself. We are on the edge. We stand on a frontier, on what in English is often called a liminal space. Sheep and shepherd. We are both sheep and shepherd, and we need guidance and we need to be called to guide. Only Christ is the chief shepherd. Only God in Christ can help people know, name, and resist the lions. The lion in our world is all that seeks to kill and to take authority over what God has the right authority. The lion is a liar and a displacer. Elders, therefore, must practice humility because we are also sheep. And anyone who watches sheep sees that sheep are not the cleverest animals on the face of the planet. Before God, everyone is humbled. No one is exalted except by God's actions. And Peter's exhortation to humility echoes the teaching in all the Gospels. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. And in this first part, uh, in this chapter, Peter goes straight from being humble to being anxious, because putting our anxieties in the hand of God is an act of humility. Go back, however long it was, to the final reflection in our retreat where Jen in a beautiful, Professor Jen Strawbridge in a beautiful reflection told us about that it's God's church. In the end, if I can put it crudely, it's God's problem, the church. And that's very reassuring 
because we're not so good at handling it ourselves. I'd much prefer God to handle it. Many translations read, cast all your anxiety on him. Happy person who only has one anxiety. Anyone here only got one anxiety? <laughs> he says, cast all your anxieties on him. It's an act of humbling ourselves. We acknowledge that God has the strength and capacity and wisdom that we do not, and we entrust ourselves to him. And he says, you don't face, you face, you don't face persecution alone. You're surrounded around the world. We've heard that. We see that in this wonderful gathering. And we are therefore to show solidarity. Unity in Christ overcomes all division and threat, even as they suffer. This letter, this beautiful letter, balances the call to resilience in situations of vulnerability and the call to resistance from positions of power when we have authority. And here at the end, we are invited to join God in his activity of putting all things in right order, the kingdom of God. The devil's work from Genesis 2 and 3 through to the end of Revelation is disintegration, to make disorder, to scatter the flock so they run in every direction. God's work from Genesis 1.1 1, 1 to the end of Revelation is integration, to make things right in the right order. Let us remember that we cannot tell people only that there is one right way to observe, to respond to suffering. The testimony of those in the midst of suffering is almost always different from those who observe it from outside. And actually, almost always better. We're going to have quite a long video now, 12 minutes, of a conversation with one of the most remarkable primates in the Anglican Communion, someone who is extraordinary, uh, Archbishop Jackson Olisapi, the primate of Kenya. Archbishop, tell us um, a little bit about your upbringing, your family, um, your background. Thank you, Your Grace, and um, thank you for welcoming me and for this interview. Um, I was born in 1964. Um, in a deep rural village in Narok, uh, uh, deep rural Kenya, uh, next to the Maasai Mara, not so far away. And uh, uh, I was born to a, a large polygamous family. My father had 11 wives, and my mother was number seven. They were not Christians. Um, and uh, around 1969, when I was four years old, my father died. I and my three sisters and my mother went back to where she was born. Uh, my sister has never had the opportunity to go to school. And I went to school because uh, the government that time uh, began to want to educate Maasai children. And there was a, a chief's act. The local chiefs were ordered by the government to bring uh, children to school. So we were rounded up and taken to school. Uh, after getting into school, a year later, uh, World Vision, a Christian organization, came to that village looking for children to sponsor. So I became one of the first cohort of sponsored oh, children in Kenya amazing. in 1975. I was a hearts boy, and uh, be be before before we, we you know we went to school. Even after uh, we went to school, every school holiday, we will be herding cattle and sheep and 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 you know and and goats uh, in terms. Uh, People in the village and young boys are trained from a very tender age 
how to herd cattle and how to live in the jungle. Uh, you know, these are jungles where you intermingle with the hyenas, with the lions, with the cheetahs and leopards, uh, buffaloes and elephants. Everything is in the jungle uh, with the mass and their livestock. Um, as we grew up, uh, part of the culture is to tease ourselves as young boys and young Morans uh, how to become a strong warrior by fighting some of those tough, tough animals. And I participated in a lion hunt, and the Maasai uh, expectation of every warrior is to participate and be part of a lion hunt and uh, lion killers. And uh, I participated in two lion and fights. This would this be in daytime or night? Daytime, daytime, yes. Uh, you, you can't really fight a lion during the night because they see better at night than we don't. But uh, during the days when we hunt, and uh, um, in one of them, uh, it was uh, actually fatal because uh, one of the young men was killed in my presence. Uh, I also have a, a lion score in my left shoulder uh, where after spearing yes, it. I can see the marks. Yes, after spearing, tried to grab me, and then the claws got in, but uh, never, uh, never pulled me because uh, he was going to, falling down because of the spear. Um, but I was lucky. Uh, Were you frightened when you went on that lion hunt? Um, yes, uh, the roaring of the lion is so, so frightening. But, uh, you know, you, 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 you psych yourselves. As young people, you know how young people can psych themselves until you are like, there's nothing. Uh, and uh, we used to tie bells around our thighs and we put some leaves on them so that they don't ring until we encircle the lion. And uh, you go and when we spot the lion and uh, we surround it and then all the, the boys will remove the, uh, the, the leaves in the bells tied to their thighs. And we begin like making every bell to, to ring. And uh, that creates a, a noisy and confused state that will confuse even the roaring of the lion. So, uh, the boys will be yelling, the lion will be roaring, the bells will be ringing. So, so we fight in confusion. It, it, it was a very confused oh, state. You, you realize what was happening afterwards. It, yeah. It's those things that uh, you don't realize what was happening when you're in it. But you, you just go and realize when you begin to reflect about it. It's extraordinary. And um, we're reading at the Lambeth Conference um, the... Uh, uh, first letter of Peter, mm. and it has that extraordinary, powerful um, passage in chapter five, where he's talking to leaders and to young people and to the church as a whole, mm. and saying, be alert, be sober, your enemy the devil, like a roaring lion, mm. prowls around mm. seeking whom to devour. Mm. Now, you, when you hear that, What's the picture in your mind? You know, there are those things you read sometimes, and uh, you know, if you have no experience, you just pass the sentence. But uh, as I read that passage, and you know, speaking of the roaring of the lion, called to my mind the roaring of the lions we fought. And uh, you know, it's not just when you are fighting. Every night, when you are living where the, the lions are, they will roar every night. Uh, and in, in me, uh, it is so fresh when I read that, I know what a lion roar means. You know, when it roars near the house, everything shakes. You know, our houses are made of, of sticks and mud, and, and you can hear, if there are utensils around, you can hear them shake, because the, the, the voice is so, so, so deep and so intense. And it is a very, very scary, especially when it roars and you are seeing it in front of you. And therefore, when the Bible speaks of, you know, the devil is roaring like a lion, I could now see the reality of, you know, the danger God is warning us that unless we cling to him, the world is a dangerous place. So when you read this as a bishop, how does it affect the way you look at the world? Does it mean that you're simply looking out for danger, or does it mean more than that? Because I'm very struck that as a young man, you didn't only hear the lion, you went out to find the lion and defeat it. So how does that work as a bishop? Yeah, um, 
Shepherding is a, is, 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 is a big thing in my culture because you, you grow into it. And shepherding means many things. Uh, and I remember when I was recruited to theological colleges at Nordinan, uh, the bishop then, when he met me for the first time, he asked me this question. Uh, have you decided to leave your father's cows to come and study to shepherd people? I said, yes. He said, do you think it is the same, shepherding cows and shepherding people? And I paused for a minute. I did not know where he was headed. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the kind of answer I gave, I don't know. I think God guided me. I said, yes, the principles are the same. Because uh, shepherding animals, you make sure that they are safe. You make sure that the, the sick are, are, are treated. Uh, uh, you, you also make sure that they, they have good pasture and, and they, they have uh, water. Uh, and therefore, you, you, you ensure they have provisions, but you also ensure that they are protected. And, and reading uh, the, the, the letter of Peter, uh, particularly chapter 5, bring to memory, you know, the way I answered that day. But now when I became bishop, it became more broad and more intense because now I will see things differently. That, that time I had a narrower sense that uh, it's only preaching, praying for them, visiting the sick, going to their homes and you know, doing pastoral care. That was my narrow sense. But my broader sense now is looking at the extended environment that protect them. It ah. make, make sure that they are food secure. Uh, so I have to challenge the nation on the agricultural policy because I care about food security. Uh, I care about national security and terrorism that is happening in, in parts of Kenya because safety is, is the work of a shepherd. Uh, I care recklessness among you know, our political class and mismanagement of the economy because it affects people directly. Uh, I, I care about the ecology and the environment because it affects us in a bigger sense, in a broader sense. Uh, and therefore, now my shepherding is not just in that narrow village sense. I look at the global picture, the national picture. Uh, we are now talking about the war in Ukraine. It's affecting everybody in the world. You know, even Kenya is not uh, uh, unaffected by the same war because we get wheat from Ukraine. And I suppose a question. I was very struck when we were all together looking at 1 Peter 5 this morning. Peter talks about being a fellow elder. Mm. Who shepherds the shepherd? Mm. <laughs> mm. How do the shepherds find a shepherd when but, they are tired and mm. worn down? Mm. Who picks them up? Yeah, that speaks to me because uh, I, I asked myself that question. Uh, recently I had my house of bishops. And you know, we are struggling who shepherd the bishop because we are yes, supposed to shepherd clergy. The then I ask, who shepherds the archbishop? And we find ourselves very vulnerable in those spaces because, you know, people don't come near you uh, sometimes unless you have opened up your heart, unless we are willing to be vulnerable before them. Uh, and therefore, it's a big struggle to know who shepherd the shepherds. But uh, my word of consolation to myself and to all of us is that we have the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ, our shepherd. Mm. If we rely on him and be humble before him, it makes me easier to come to you and lay bare my vulnerability. Uh -huh. Because God humbles. If I have a relationship with Jesus, I will be able to create a fellowship of people around us uh, who can tell us when we are not doing right, who can show us what we don't know, who can enable us to see things we don't see. Because sometimes this busy life block our minds and our eyes to see even the most important things around ourselves. And I find myself in that position many times that I'm so blinded by a busy life yes. that I don't see the most important things around myself. And uh, therefore, we need, we need God to show us who can give us support because we are human and we are weak like everybody else. And, and I think that's what we need to learn from Peter as a church and ask ourselves, are we playing the elders role? Are we humble enough? Are we showing by example? Do we show them what to do and how to do it? Yeah. Uh, yes. 
That's right, yes. yes. And I think when Peter is talking to himself as an elder among elders, he has reduced himself to the same level. Isn't that extraordinary? The Apostle Peter yes. reduces himself to their level. Yes. It's so beautiful, that. Yeah. Uh, it inspires me. Your Grace, Archbishop Jackson, thank you very, very much indeed. That has been wonderful. I'm thank so you. grateful. Thank you so much. May God bless you. That was, that interview was cut back from, uh, was edited down from being about an hour and 20 minutes. Um, and, and really, it was a life-changing experience to hear him. What I should have said before introducing him was, as you will hear from, as we heard from him, the lion is fought and defeated in situations of chaos. Except those taking on the lion are united in their confusion. I was very amused by someone talking uh, uh, the other day here, I think many of us heard it, who was trying to say that the Archbishop is an instrument of communion and managed to say the, Arch the Archbishop of Canterbury is an instrument of confusion. Um, <laughs> The, uh, there's an English saying, many a true word is said in jest. <laughs> Unity is chaotic and messy. Unity can be confusing because unity doesn't mean agreement. But we are united in Christ against the lion. We are united in our care for God's flock. Unity is needed even in the midst of chaos of our own making very often to defeat the roaring lion. And we have heard in that conversation astonishing, memorable reflections on the fear, the terror, the danger, the confusion that roaring lions create. And we've heard how the role of a shepherd is to be a leader, an exemplar, who is humble and finds their strength and hope in the chief shepherd. But ultimately, the story of how to take on a roaring lion, of how to protect the flock, of how to lead as one of the elders, the Sum Presbyteroi, is a story of unity and solidarity, even in the midst of confusion and chaos. And Peter ends by returning once again to the central themes of hope, suffering, and glory in Christ. His final call is one of reconciliation, to stay in relationship and in stand in solidarity with brothers and sisters who are suffering. And it makes me ask, how will we shepherd differently after gathering together in this place? How will we ensure that we are in relationship and constantly being transformed, being transformed into the likeness of Christ? How will we hold on to the encounter with one another and with God in this place? Because without relationship and without encounter, there is trouble ahead. And if I could sing, I'd start a little song that has that as the first line. But I will spare you that great pain and suffering. There is trouble ahead without relationship. Because when we don't have a relationship, His Grace Archbishop Tarbo sitting there is not my friend who I know and pray for. He is a thing. He is the Archbishop of Southern Africa. And it's much easier not to love a thing than not to love a person, a person with whom we have relationship. It's not, we must remain in community. It's not a one-off thing. Like so much of Peter's ethics, 
It is living and continuous, dynamic, extending, growing, deepening. And Peter returns to the promise of the glory of Christ, who already has victory over the demonic, a cosmic victory over the lion. The shepherds are part of that resurrection victory. The call of the Christian and the promise of the, to the Christian is to share both the suffering and the resurrection and the glory of Christ. And that is our good news. It's temporary, the suffering. At the end of the letter, the promise of what salvation entails is specific. We are called to eternal glory in Christ. Just in your minds, say to yourself, I am called to eternal glory in Christ. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. This is the God who takes on our anxieties, the God who does not delegate restoration, but does it God's self. This is the God in whom Peter's followers must trust. This is the God who in verse 11 of chapter 5, we say, to him be power forever and ever. Whatever suffering is endured for Christ, and in this room it is huge, God's promises revealed in Christ are God's promises, God's business, God's work, God's action, God's decision. And they are eternal, assured, and wonderful beyond all human imagination. And the power and promise of God will always have the final word, peace to all of you who are in Christ. Let us pray. And we close these expositions with uh, a prayer of thanksgiving. Holy, mighty God, cosmic creator, redeemer, the one who is shaping us day by day, who is transforming us every time we pray. We thank you and marvel and wonder and praise and worship that we are your personal concern, that you are working in each of us, in the flocks that between us all in this room, women and men, bishops, spouses, helpers, supporters, you are working in all of us that we may be those who in humility cast our anxieties on you and are destined for eternal glory. Only you can hold this. Only we can respond in thankfulness in praise, in wonder, in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Wow. Thank you so much, Archbishop Justin, for that incredibly moving exposition. I wonder if we could once again show our thanks for all that Archbishop Justin has shared with us. Before we go off to our Bible study groups, um, just a very quick forward look so that you are aware tomorrow morning in the first session of the morning at 9.15 in venue one, for the bishops, we're going to be receiving a number of statements of support. Now, these are statements relating to places and situations around the world which need our prayers and about which we would want to make a statement as a conference. The documents with all of the statements on, their brief statements, will be available to you. The stewards will be handing them to you as you leave for your Bible study groups today. They will also be emailed to you. So tomorrow morning, Archbishop Justin will introduce the session and a number of bishops will present to us the statements to be received and we'll offer, we will offer our prayers together. We know that there are many situations and places in the world that need our prayers and so we'll be specifically praying together for them in that first session tomorrow. And tomorrow, uh, that is Saturday morning, the spouses are invited to gather in venue two uh, from half past nine for a plenary session that starts at 10 till uh, 11.15 to look at what will we be taking forward. As usual, uh, please head off to your Bible study groups. You may have tea or coffee there. We will see the bishops here at 11.45 for a plenary on discipleship. Thank you. I think that plenary is for everybody, bishops and spouses. Oh, bishops yeah, and spouses, sorry, thank you. Everybody back here, yeah, thank you.